By the time you get to my age, it, it's very easy to tell a story about your career and you can make it sound very linear and as if at every stage you had a, a cunning plan for what you were going to do. But of course, the reality is very different. And I've tried to be honest about that in my next few slides. So, so the first thing is, very few of us end up doing exactly what we think we're going to do the day we get into medical school. So when I was at school, I thought I'd like to be a doctor. I had no idea what sort of doctor. When I was a medical student, I thought neurology was very clever and, you know, bound to be interesting. Uh, when I became a junior doctor, I became very um, keen to do what I could for uh, the elderly who I felt, you know, were, were quite neglected in academia and yet presented the majority of clinical problems. And I actually went off to do a registrar job in respiratory medicine only because I was advised to get some general experience before trying to become an academic geriatrician. But then I arrived um, in respiratory medicine and it just clicked. I thought it was a really interesting specialty. You saw the whole spectrum of people from young people with asthma through to older people with COPD and cancer. And I just found it a very interesting area of medicine. And so, of course, you realize that actually deciding to do one particular job or indeed one particular placement or SSC can actually have a very defining effect on your future career path. I didn't decide what specialty I was going to do until I was quite well into my training and I didn't resolve the issue of whether I wanted to have children and be a clinical academic until even later on. Um, so you, you do make decisions along the way. Um, it doesn't all appear fully formed in your mind. The second thing I learned is in all of medicine, but perhaps even more so in uh, academic medicine, teamwork is everything. You can only do what you want to do by working as part of a clinical team and by working um, with other researchers. You know, you obviously have to build up your own team uh, who can help you do the program of work you want to do. But the real advances, the real breakthroughs come by working with other people, particularly people that you wouldn't naturally expect to work with, but you just have a good idea and you go and talk to them about it. Um, the other thing I would say is you really, really need to have some mentors. And I, I don't mean that in a, in a very formal way, but actually it's really good to have people a bit senior to you that you trust and to whom you can speak about your career ambitions. And they may not be mentors for the whole of your career, the whole of your life. You can choose different people at different times, but you know, people increasingly recognize that mentors are very important. Uh, some training schemes now formalize this, um, but before you can blink, you'll discover that you're mentoring people junior to you. You will maybe go back to your old school and talk about being a medical student. You know, as a preclinical student, you may want to speak to uh, somebody who's coming up to finals. You know, as a foundation doctor, the final year students will want to talk to you. So it becomes part of our life and actually both important and rewarding. The other big challenges, well, I've just put up one slide, but you know, there are diversity issues in medicine. We, we know that. And this is just one example. This is about the gender balance in clinical academia, which is something I feel very strongly about. You know, there are also issues about ethnicity, disability, you know, we want to be very careful, I think, in all that we do to select talent wherever 
wherever it is, you know, and, and not to allow systems to develop that are biased in some ways. So this is data from five years ago, and I'm pleased to say it is much improved locally and nationally. But five, only five years ago, we had a situation where 63% of new medical students in the UK were female, but fewer than 20% of clinical professors. But gradually, we are seeing that improve. But we do have to be very mindful, I think, about creating career paths that don't put unnecessary barriers in people's way. And actually, I chose as a good example of that, again, my colleague, Sarah Wormsley, um, who was asked by the Wellcome Trust, who have funded her for a very long time, to put her own career trajectory. And you begin to see, you know, the way in which you progress up through the fellowship route to end up a professor. You, you know, you can have children along the way. You can be a consultant, a respected member of the clinical team, and you can also drive your own research program. So, you know, looking at how other people have done things, it doesn't mean you have to do the same, but you can learn from understanding other people's career pathway.